Hello, good afternoon everyone. Welcome to the Great Exhibition Road Festival today. We're so glad to welcome you back to South Kensington for the Great Exhibition Road Festival. The theme this year is One World. This talk is part of our art and science stream where we um, explore individuals and uh, projects that blur the line between art and science. Um, I'm really excited to introduce you to our speaker today. Uh, before we do, there's just a couple of things to note. So we will have questions at the end. Um, so if you're in the room, you can stick your hand up at that point and we'll come to you. We'll come to you with a microphone on a big long boom. So you can just sit where you are and wait for that microphone to come to you. If you're watching online on YouTube, you can put questions there and they will filter through to me. So at the end, I can put them to our speaker as well. Realize I forgot to introduce myself. My name's Hayley Dunning and I am the media manager for natural sciences here at Imperial College London, which basically means that I write about science. But today I'm your host for the talks this afternoon and I'll be uh, hosting the Q&A later. Just before I introduce our speaker, one final thing for people in the room, just a few COVID notes. So uh, please remember that these measures are in place to keep everyone safe. So when you're sitting down, just stay seated and stay one meter away from anyone who's not in your household. If you've taken off your mask, now you've sat down, please do put it back on for the duration of the discussion. Um, and like I said, when the questions come, we'll come to you with a boom mic. Uh, and when the talk finishes, do just clear the lecture theatre as soon as possible and we advise you to wash and sanitise your hands because we have to get ready for the next talk. So, without further ado, behind me here is Dr. Julius Bryant. He has worked at the Victoria and Albert Museum since 2005 as Keeper of Word and Image, which is the department responsible for the collections of paintings, prints, drawings, photography, architecture, design, the archive of art and design for the National Art Library. Quite the task. Dr. Bryant has been lead curator for several V&A exhibitions, including William Kent, Designing George and Britain in 2013, and John Lockwood Kipling, Art and Design in the Punjab in London in 2017. He's also published several books on aspects of history of the V&A. Today, we're marking the 170th anniversary of the Great Exhibition, the original Great Exhibition, and he has kindly agreed to share with us his current research as a preview of a book he looks forward to completing in his new position as Keeper Emeritus at the V&A. So I'll hand you over now to the capable hands of Julius. Well, good afternoon, everybody. I hope you can all hear me okay. Um, it's great to be uh, speaking to a live audience. Thank you so much for coming. It's been a long time with COVID and lockdown and talking to a laptop for a year and a half. And, uh, but it, this is the first time I've ever spoken to a masked audience. So um, thank you for keeping your masks on. But it does rather look like a sort of scene from James Bond movie, as though I should be sort of presenting to you how we're going to raid Fort Knox or something. It looks like a sort of heist planning gang, but thank you very much for coming. Thanks also to the Royal Commission for the ex Great Exhibition of 1851. Nigel Williams, the Secretary of the Commission, invited me to give this talk, and I'm, I'm most grateful to him for that. Um, it is 170 years ago since Saturday the 11th of October 1851. I know it's Saturday the 9th of October 2021, but 170 years ago this Saturday, the Great Exhibition closed. So it's a special treat for me to be marking this occasion. A uh, great exhibition that is still really, I think, regarded as the world's greatest exhibition. Uh, the, it started that great tradition of world's fairs, uh, the expos that are still running. There is the one just opened this month in Dubai, the latest. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's also aroused a lot of debate and controversy about what it was all about. I, uh, I, I work in the V&A, the library there. I typed into our catalogue to see just how many titles I'd get for the words Great Exhibition 1851, um, was, which was uh, two and a half thousand uh, uh, in, the, in the library. So there's been a lot published, but uh, I don't think they all really yet agreed what it's all about. And uh, what I want to do very simply is to take you through the Great Exhibition and look at the sort of star attractions that were there. Uh, so a, a, a visual visit. There are online excellent uh, computer reconstructions of the interior of the Crystal Palace, and, but they tend to be about the, more about the architecture than the objects. And I want us to look at what they called at the time the, the lions of the exhibition, the must-see objects. And uh, that's what we're going to do. And also, I want to try and 
make the case, I mean, this is not an academic conference, but I, I do, um, I'm working this up, you know, uh, which is work in progress. And I want to make the case that people have generally started from the wrong position about trying to understand what it was all about. There is this debate, uh, this confusion. There, there is a, the only consensus is that it was spectacular, rather bewildering, and it meant many different things to many different people. And one of the causes for that confusion, which I'm going to float here for the first time, is that we've been going in the wrong door. Uh, and we'll come back to that. But this is, I'm starting with this official image. Uh, official because my main source is going to be a book of uh, color, 52 color prints that Prince Albert commissioned with Queen Victoria as a souvenir of the great exhibition. And this is the view that they, commissioned uh, from Joseph Nash in 1851. The book is published in 1854. It took a long time to pull together. But this is, if you like, the official uh, view of the Great Exhibition and probably perfectly familiar to you. But don't underestimate that tree. We'll come back to it and the way the light is falling. I'll explain later, but I do think that's one of the basic causes of the, of the confusion is, uh, is people, historians haven't quite remembered where the front door was. If you want to see the, you can visit the great exhibition today. You can just walk up the road. We're on exhibition road, top of the street is this big lawn. If you've ever wondered uh, if you've been up there, that is where it was. You can go and stand inside one of the great architectural ghosts of London. The building uh, hasn't been replaced. It hasn't, developers haven't got there because it was in Hyde Park next to Kensington Gardens. And I'm told that the concrete foundations of the Crystal Palace are still there beneath the turf. But when you're up there, uh, here's some uh, signage from the park itself, which just help you orientate. So on the right-hand side is that lawn, the old football pitches, site of the Great Exhibition. And on the left of my snap from the graphic in the park is the Albert Memorial. Now, if you're looking for the legacy, the visual legacy of the Great Exhibition, you might wander along to the Albert Memorial and think that that is it. Um, Prince Albert's memorial, uh, he died in 1861, the memorial completed 1877 by George Gilbert Scott. On the right, you can see just a little signage, excellent little bit of interpretation, but that's it next to the lawn. Uh, but Albert is not here uh, part of a monument to the Great Exhibition. This is a monument to Albert. The, the only hint in, of the Great Exhibition of the Crystal Palace in this great shrine to him is the book he's holding, which is uh, the, always said to be the, the catalogue of the Great Exhibition. Now, in reality, it was uh, three volumes thick, and uh, so perhaps I should have had him juggling all three to be true. Go around the other side of the Albert Hall, and you'll find what is actually the monument to the Great Exhibition. But, and, and do go up there. It's only a minute's walk from where we are now. Uh, and you'll find it doesn't really help much with understanding what it was all about. It's rather like a budget sheet that what's wrapped around this column are the numbers, the vital statistics, you know, the numbers of people who came and, and so on. I'm sorry. <laughs> of course, the, the great legacy, the, the real monument to the Great Exhibition is, is where we are, uh, is... Imperial College, uh, Science Museum, Natural History Museum, v &A, this whole sort of town, uh, this what they called at the time Albertopolis, Prince Albert's vision of creating a, a cultural quarter for London, London's first cultural quarter at that time here in South Kensington. So top right of the screen is, is that lawn where the Crystal Palace was and running up the center of this photograph is, is Exhibition Road. So we're just in the middle on the left now. So it's all around us. And you'll notice on the right, there's the V&A. So if you want to really know more about uh, the Crystal Palace rather than read two and a half thousand books, you could go into the V&A. That's just where we are, a little helpful orientation, the palace bottom left. And then before uh, the exhibition ends, uh, it's, it's all uh, sort of countryside really, still at that point around here. Uh, and uh, of course, you know the story, I'm sure, that the exhibition is such a success, made such a huge profit that they decide to buy up the neighborhood and build on it uh, a, a sort of center for the arts and sciences together. 
So into the B&A in the garden, you'll find in the courtyard in the center, the old Victorian entrance to the museum. And uh, in its pediment above the front door, you'll find a sort of tribute image, this silhouette of the Crystal Palace uh, with Queen Victoria in the middle, uh, handing out the crowns to the winners, the, the prize winners from all around the world. And there it is, the exhibition of the works of industry of, of all nations. Uh, it's important to remember that works of industry doesn't mean industrial works. It's not just about machines. It's, it's about hard work. It's, it's about people being industrious. That's the sort of main message. So we have things other than machines and, and industry. We have uh, handicrafts and works of art as well. And then if you go into the British galleries of the V&A, you'll find a section devoted to the Crystal Palace, the exhibition, and some of the objects that were in the Crystal Palace that were bought as, if you like, the foundation collections for the museum. So the V&A is really the, is founded on the, the success of the Crystal Palace. There are lots and lots of books, as I mentioned, and these are the, the classic works uh, that I just thought I'd put on screen for you. And there are lots of interpretations. There's been quite a quite a bonanza in research since the 1990s and uh, very inspiring essays and, and monographs. They, it, there's various views. It, some people approach it as a great celebration of Britain, as the uh, workshop of the world, uh, as the great industrial lead nation of the world. Uh, also it's celebrated as uh, the British Empire and other empires. Uh, the French, the Austrian, uh, the Ottoman, the Age of Empires. It's uh, also, of course, a, a trade fair. It's, it's, it's all contemporary pro products are being promoted. Uh, businessmen are looking for markets and for new suppliers. So it's a contemporary trade fair. There's no price labels. Things are not actually for sale, though, of course, they, they sell afterwards. And it's a celebration of free trade, which was a, a, a new uh, development, a removal of the import-export barriers. So it's a sort of promotion. So a, a commercial endeavor. But it's also seen to have higher ambitions of, uh, and was stated at the time to, to try to bring together the arts and sciences in Prince Albert's mind and uh, achieve world peace, nothing less. Another book that really overshadows all those is that came out in 1951 on the centenary is Nikolaus Pevsner's High Victorian Design, a study of the exhibits of 1851, which unfortunately uh, really used as its source images all this kind of thing, which is the, the uh, sort of Rococo revival, 18th century style images that were reproduced in magazines at the time. And I want to try to get away from all that, which I think harms the reputation. People have off, have, Keep, still keep saying they loved the building, but they hated the contents. And, it, and really, that's an exaggeration. There were, some, there were some things inside that people liked, and those are the ones I want to particularly draw to your attention. Uh, just look at this contrast, though, before and after. So this is a, uh, one of those plates from that book that Albert commissioned, and the watercolor on the left. And you can see the difference. Um, the, the patron and the publisher have probably said, they looked at this watercolor and said to the artist, can you put some more nice young ladies in it? And um, this, this clearly it's been added to. And also, can they be, those that are there, can they please be reading the guidebook? You know, this was a, uh, an exhibition that you found your way around and you learned it was an educational project. At least they wanted to have it remembered as such. So visual evidence that I'm going to be showing you uh, has to be uh, taken with a pinch of salt. These are uh, artists' impressions. So lots of other visual material to draw upon if you want to go to the library, the V&A, and, and we must remember that this was, uh, this was a fair with prizes, not cash prizes, but medals were being awarded. Medal, medals for, for beauty and ingenuity. And uh, the, 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 funnily enough, the British won most of the medals that <laughs> the judges decided, and the French came second. But, it, but beauty was one of the criterion. Um, the, the, the top medal uh, was awarded the Council Medal for, I quote, originality combined with great beauty of design or some important novelty of invention. So it wasn't novelty of design, it was beauty of design and novelty of invention. So the new inventions 
and beauty. And I think it really, we must remember that it was a beauty contest as well, this show. It wasn't just about engineering. Prince Albert um, chairs the organizing committee, the Royal Commission for the Great Exhibition, 1851. And this is the, the awkward moment when they have to decide on the building. Uh, these are the great plans that they have, uh, rather nebulous and overambitious, perhaps, uh, expectations of what the exhibition could do. Prince Albert and then below Henry Cole, his right-hand man for delivering the exhibition, his administrator, who becomes the first director of, of the museum. So with these very different uh, range of ambitions, uh, it's not surprising that people today are still confused as to what it was all about. That's what we nearly had instead of the Crystal Palace. This is the, uh, they had an architectural competition, 245 entries. They didn't like any of them. So the uh, judges designed this themselves and then nobody wanted to build it. Uh, so that didn't happen. This is what Joseph Paxton came up with instead, uh, doodling on his blotter. And then on the right, having the cheek to publish it before it had even gone to committee. And then as we saw earlier, the, the finished product. But this is um, an artist impression, very like the Illustrated London News, that shows how it originally was conceived. And I, I'm gonna play my main card now, which is to say, you can see here that it's the left-hand side that has all the crowds, that, has, um, that is facing towards what's now the Albert Memorial and of course towards Kensington Palace. And this is the first published official print. And this is a view as if from a, a, a balloon um, from the northwest. So there's the west entrance and Rotten Row, the, the, the polite um, promenade in the foreground. But, but we always tend to think of it from the south. If we just zoom in on the west entrance, you'll, sign, you'll see outside it this statue of which you now know from the Houses of Parliament where it lives. Marachetti's statue of Richard the Lionheart. And that really is the first of my lions, the must-see objects. And this is clearly, and this is, this is what Albert wanted as the memorial to the Great Exhibition. This statue in Hyde Park didn't happen. But clearly, this is the way you're supposed to go in. And uh, the huge floor plan is very lucid, very well structured. Uh, it's not chaotic at all. And if you read the guidebook, this is the Schilling guidebook, and it's the fourth edition, uh, the ground floor, uh, south side commencing at the west end. So there, there you have it, I think there's no argument. You're meant to go in the west end. And uh, Main Avenue is where the great sculptures are assembled. And on the right, I show you a sort of list of all the sculptures. So you do have a, you do have a logic and, um, the, and it's clearer even in sort of modern transcripts. So the left-hand side is all British and British colonies and dominions, so India and Canada and so forth. And the right side is the, the rest of the world. And uh, people, uh, countries are, uh, got as much space as they traded with Britain. So France is the largest, uh, gets a quarter of the space on the right. And then there's an upstairs for lighter, less heavy objects, such as um, photography and surgical instruments, uh, washing machines, all sorts of like. There are great visions for the colors that can be put into the interior. That's by Owen Jones. And this great avenue, this sort of central, they call it the transept. And there are definitely sort of Christian overtones to the vocabulary of this building. But this also gives you an idea of the crowds of people that were there. People were coming to look at people as well. And the decoration here with banners for all the uh, major cities of Britain. A lot of civic pride, a lot of patriotism, countries showing their best wares. And, and um, but people were coming to see people, to see the world. And this is, so this is the, the, uh, the east-west, the west-east central avenue, and then there's a north-south avenue as well. But where it starts to reorientate is with the royal visits. And you, so you see the, the arched entrance, this, which we now think of as the face of the museum, of the, sorry, of the Crystal Palace, um, and that sort of barrel vault that was built to accommodate trees. In the opening ceremonies and in the records of 1st of May, 1851, the trees always seem to appear very picturesque. And that I think has given this greater emphasis to the south entrance. There is the opening ceremony, 25,000 people. And of course we tend to forget 
just how crowded it was. And my, after the Richard the Lionheart, my next major must-see object that people talk about at the time is this crystal fountain at the center, the intersection of the, the nave and the transept. And uh, what I find, and it, it, once you notice it, it keeps turning up in all the images. And it even, they even have a royal walkabout, the first ever official royal walkabout. But what I didn't realize until starting work on this project was this, the crystal fountain, was actually a huge advertising stunt by Schweppes. The year before, in Malvern, Schweppes had started bottling their mineral water. So they paid for this fountain. And uh, you, you, know, you, have, you have Victor and Albert being posing in front of it. Now imagine if, if a certain royal couple today were posing in front of you know, a, a Schweppes fountain. It would, it would be very criticized as sort of advertising, but clearly um, that, that was, a, but it was a magnificent thing. It weighed tons and tons and uh, many feet tall. And it was one of the, the must see objects. It rather outshone the Kohinoor diamond, which was Queen Victoria's uh, personal loan. It had been given to her uh, in 1850. It had been acquired through the Treaty of Lahore from the, um, the, the, the treasury in Lahore. But people were very disappointed by the Kohinoor diamond. It hadn't been well cut at that point. And uh, though, the, though the cartoon from the time shows the crowds that needed to see it, uh, it, it had to be uh, taken away, put in a, in a sort of black cabinet and, and given special lighting before, um, before the show closed. Another popular attraction was the medieval court. So it wasn't all, as um, Pevsner's book suggests, sort of French 18th century taste. And this was one of the great successes because the Houses of Parliament were still being fitted out at this point by Pugin, the designer of this medieval court. So this was giving people a bit of a preview also of how the Houses of Parliament would look uh, once they're finished. And I wanted just to remind you that this was when policemen first become a, a, a familiar sight in London. Police force created in 1829, but the man on the right is a policeman, and then you have there are 400 policemen on duty, and you have interpreters, presenters for each of the companies seen here, uh, the man in the sort of brown coat. So lots of British towns um, putting up their best show. This is Bradford, um, I, I forget where, but, and then onto the machinery, so other things people really wanted to see. And this was uh, an age when machines were uh, threatening uh, the work of many people in the countryside, the rural labor force were being replaced by machines. A bit like computers, have we felt about them in the 1970s, that they could be a, a threat to us all. This is a, a popular attraction. This is a machine that can make 2,700 envelopes in an hour. So there were a lot, there was, this was the acceptable face of the Industrial Revolution, so which people wanted to see but also heavy machinery. And here you have on the bottom right, this farmer, gray haired old farmer with his walking stick peering at agricultural machinery. Uh, and this is sort of polite propaganda really, you know, how we can start to bring steam engines into the fields, into the countryside. Uh, British uh, Sheffield uh, heavy manufacturing. And then this great avenue, which really leads us to sculptures, which I want to run through now. So um, in that avenue, you saw perhaps the tallest thing there is this canopy in the middle. And uh, you see it again on the left here. So this is a very famous popular sculpture. It had been reproduced. People would have recognized it. It's by John Bell, and it's called the Eagle Slayer. And uh, this is in iron, cast iron, made by Colbrook Dale. And they were showing off that they could make something of fine art in, in iron, in a heavy material, their casting was so sophisticated. And for the exhibition, they also created this canopy. And so the sculpture is at the, on the ground floor, at, at the bottom of it. And the, uh, what's happened is there's a shepherd who's got his dead lamb between his legs on the ground, and he's taking his revenge on the eagle flying overhead. And uh, to show off their skill as, as iron makers, they create, Colbrookdale have created this canopy that rather, rather literally has an eagle at the top who's skewered by the arrow to sort of complete the sculpture. Perhaps more acceptable now is, is this also by Colbrookdale, uh, Andromache, captive Andromache, 
which was purchased by Queen Victoria from the exhibition. And you can see it today at Osborne, uh, Queen Victoria's house on the Isle of Wight, as the centerpiece of her garden fountain. So Queen Victoria bought a lot of things from the Great Exhibition. But it was really India that stole the show that people had to see, the Great uh, East India Company display. And people saw Indian arts and crafts that came as a revelation and very inspiring, not just uh, the wonderful weaving, and, but jewelry and uh, textiles and uh, even sort of a, a howder on a, on a stuffed elephant borrowed from the Saffron Warden Museum. But in the centerpiece, the big marquee and this carved ivory throne, also lent by Queen Victoria, that was given to her by the Maharaja of Travancore. So that, again, it's something you had to go and see. Canada, uh, also one of the dominions. I, this would have been one I certainly would have been after to see all these sort of moose heads and, and snowshoes and things. But it was really France that you, you also had to have an opinion about especially French furniture and the Sèvres porcelain, uh, which would win many prizes. And France had its colony, Algeria, there as well. <clears throat> Germany uh, had the second most space after France in the foreign section. But the, um, Germany didn't quite exist then. There was uh, North Germany, there was the Zollverein, hadn't, the unification hadn't happened. But what everybody seems to agree was the most important thing to see is this statue by August Kiss, which is called uh, the Amazon. Charles Dickens went to the exhibition twice, and he said, all I can remember was the fountain and the Amazon. Uh, and this, is, this gets reproduced in many formats but as, as a must-see object. Uh, it's, you can see um, the bronze version of it in Berlin today, on the left, outside the Alters Museum. And there's a photograph of it uh, in, in the Crystal Palace. And in reply to the Germans and indeed to Prince Albert's you know, love of the Marrakechi statue of Richard the Lionheart, his uncle, King Leopold of the Belgians, uh, commissioned for the Belgian stand this uh, sta equestrian statue of Godfrey de Bouillon. So Richard the Lionheart was well known, far more <laughs> known than today because of Walter Scott's book novel, 1829, uh, the Tales of the Crusades. So Richard de Lionheart is in the Third Crusade and uh, Godfrey de Brion is in the First Crusade. So Belgium is sort of trumping. Uh, and if you go to Belgium, to Brussels, you'll find that statue or rather the, the bronze version uh, in the main city square today. But the thing, I, if, I, if I could go back in time, the thing I would most want to see personally is the Austrian stand, which wasn't just a stand, it was a series of four big rooms with, with floorboards and carved furniture throughout, like period rooms in, in a museum. And it had uh, this huge bed, so the watercolor on the left and the real thing on the right and the printed one on the right. And as you can see, they've added lots more figures. Uh, the fountain on the, on the left of the watercolor is uh, full of uh, eau de cologne, but it kept running out. Everybody keep, you gotta go to the Austria stand to get the free eau de cologne. Uh, and I just wonder if the Austrians thought the English must be very smelly people that you know, had, to, had to provide constant <laughs> uh, eau de cologne. But this bed uh, was the most elaborate piece of carving and very controversial. Uh, people thought it was either you know, a cathedral to sleep or it was fit only for a corpse in a, in a state bed. Um, we'll come back to, to another piece of Austrian carving later. This is the Russian stand, which was famous for its Malachite and its candelabra. If you've been to Apsley House at Hyde Park Corner, you'll know this, this kind of thing. Uh, the Chinese stand, you have to ignore the sculpture. The Chinese were, were there uh, represented by dealers, but much criticized for the fussiness, the overworking uh, labor without purpose. Um, so it's the wrong kind of industry uh, for the Chinese. Um, and then Turkey had its stand designed by Prince Albert's friend Gottfried Semper. And it's a great uh, theatrical set uh, and uh, really focusing on, uh, on it, Turkey as a, a trading nation. So uh, one huge bazaar uh, with these uh, great sort of marquee effects. But Tunis also was much admired, like India, for its design work and its textiles 
and uh, but also I'm afraid caricatured. Uh, so a lot of the images are totally non. PC, uh, and I've been very selective, but here we have a peep on the right, a peep into Tunis, um, or a walk through the rag fair, and these elegant English ladies are, are weeping with, I guess, from the dust uh, from the, um, so reinforcing national stereotypes of the time. But the end, the far east end of the, of the ground floor was given over to the United States, and this was a very, I think, provocative, controversial statue to show this is the Greek slave by Hiram Powers, by American sculptor, and very much shown as a, as a work of art in its own velvet uh, little back setting. And uh, there would be a man with a stick who would rotate it for viewers to admire. And people would have known it already, it's 1844, uh, because it was already being mass produced as little statuettes, Perian ware, that you could have at home. But uh, uh, slavery had not yet been abolished in America. And uh, on the right, so a lot of popular imagery of, of this statue. But on the right, a cartoon, really, if you can call it a cartoon, from Punch called The Virginian Slave um, as a reply, as a reminder to the Americans uh, that they had not yet abolished slavery in, in their country. Uh, if one getting towards the end of this rapid walkthrough, uh, you go through the furs and the, and the feathers and you'll come in as the signs say you'll come into the refreshments area. So uh, three large refreshment zones and, um, and, and toilets beyond the first public toilets in London, uh, where, you, where, you, where they invented the phrase spend a penny because you have to pay to use them and everything cost, everything was, a, was on a business. This is not a, a government taxpayer funded project. You know, this is a private enterprise by Royal Commission. Lots of souvenir merchandise you can find in the v &A. And I want now just to go into the v and collections and because uh, it all had to be dispersed as this cartoon by George Cruikshank shows. Many of the recognizable objects I've been showing you are here in, uh, being somehow distributed to the world um, as the fair closes, as I say, um, 11th of, Saturday the 11th of October. Um, 18, 1851. The main um, place to go shopping for the people intent on creating a legacy institution is first the, the medieval court. So this was seen as a great success. There is a budget given to uh, the, the man who becomes the first director of the V&A, Henry Cole, to go and buy things before the show shuts. And uh, these are uh, objects that were on the medieval um, court stand, uh, you may recognize from the watercolors. This, uh, this cabinet on the left, also in the V&A today, uh, a Florentine cabinet, brand new object. It would have, uh, I think it, it cost 400 pounds, which today is about 14,000 um, pounds. And on the right, a, a flagon, which you also you can find, you can walk around the V&A's galleries and see these. Sevres was much admired by the British, and they were buying not just for a museum, but for the pub, for the art school that they felt they had to create, or rather reinvent, uh, boost the existing uh, sort of national art school in London with a study collection, with, with a teaching collection. That's really where the v as origins lie in, uh, sort of in trying to improve product design in Britain through uh, the art school. The art school that we now know as the Royal College of Art, which used to be in, in the V&A, along with what we now know as Imperial College. I mentioned the Indian goods, uh, all sorts of things with great treasures. Uh, so they do, they buy um, 244 objects, of 150 of which are Indian. These are particularly of interest to English textile manufacturers. You could see how the sort of flat pattern uh, ornament um, worked so well, and the color harmonies especially. If you've been following Secrets of the Museum on TV, the series about the V&A, um, you'll have heard me talk about this writing box before now, because this, this was given to Queen Victoria by the, uh, the exhibitors, the East India Company, and she gave it to the museum. So it's one of the very, very first, I think it's number three in the museum's inventory. But there were other things that are in the museum um, and I'm glad somebody laughed because 
I feel that the display in the V&A needs to have a, a sort of health warning on it because it wasn't just the successes uh, that have found their way into the museum. And in that display uh, in our British galleries, there are also some very flashy objects that were acquired almost 100, well, more than 100 years later. So 1851, October, they're buying up the really good things that they feel have lessons for us all and for British design. Uh, so they accepted that the, the exhibition revealed that Britain, whilst being the workshop of the world, was tending to produce things uh, more cheaply and uh, mass producing and not producing high quality things that uh, that really were beautiful, such as the uh, Serre vases, the French especially. But these kind of things, so these are bought in the 1950s, the 1960s, there's a big revival of Victorian art. Uh, I think it really starts uh, 1951, the, re the revival of 1851, there's, there's exhibitions and books, and then there's a bit of a reaction against Pevsner's dismissal of it all and sort of snob, intellectual snobbery, I think we'd have to say. Um, so they start acquiring things for the museum that, that were shown in 1851. But these are not beautiful prize winning. These didn't win any medals. These are the kind of things that were made for, uh, for, for a great exhibition. They are to catch your eye. They are eye catchers in a very crowded, very competitive environment where the manufacturers uh, it's rather like things in a shop window. So people talk about the flashy taste, but it wasn't anybody's taste. These are these are salesmen trying to show off the skills, the virtuosity that, that, that they can bring to their particular materials. This is one of my favorites, Bashaw the dog, a uh, huge, huge life-size New Newfoundland dog in marble in the V&A, but it's only by Matthew Coates Wyatt. There you see him in the main avenue of the British section with all these intelligent men with their top hats admiring it. Um, but uh, it's only bought by the v in 1960. And likewise, some of the Majolica, which was a sensation at the time, um, and a lot of it <laughs> that the v &A acquired has, has since disappeared. Uh, uh, it wasn't just the art school and the museum to be that were buying, but also the Museum of Practical Geology in German Street at that time, which specialized um, in in, in ceramics, so there's Minton and Wedgwood uh, now in the V&A because that museum no longer survives. And this is uh, part of a huge dessert service uh, that Queen Victoria uh, wanted uh, for to give to uh, the Emperor of Austria. The reason she wanted she wanted to give him that dessert service made by Minton is that he had given her this. So I mentioned earlier that amazing bed, the state bed that's fit only for a corpse of an emperor <laughs> in the view of one uh, leading artist at the time. But the V&A was given this, the, so Queen Victoria was given this bookcase and uh, it eventually found its way into the V&A. It's, it's colossal, uh, it's a cathedral for books, it's well over 10 feet tall. Um, and on the right, uh, a very recent acquisition, 2002, this is a, again a, a sort of colossal uh, Meissen bars made for the exhibition uh, by the Berlin Porcelain Company, Meissen. Uh, and Prince Albert acquired this and gave it to um, the, the, the chairman of, of, the, of the building committee, uh, William Cubitt, and his descendants passed through the family and, and they gave it to the v in 2002. So it wouldn't be fair to judge the Crystal Palace exhibition and British taste by the, the slightly mixed range, the mixed bag of objects. And I, I began with lions and I, I don't really want to end with um, white elephants. I love these things, you know, I would never say they're white elephants. Where else can you keep a white elephant fed and clean except in the v and um, so, so let's uh, let's celebrate them, but let's not judge British taste of the time and uh, and and the success or failure of the Great Exhibition in terms of these kind of, of objects. So just as a postscript, rather than end on that slightly negative note, I want you, I'm sure you're wondering what happened next in, in sort of five minutes that remain. And there might be some questions that I can anticipate now. So uh, it made a, a vast profit, 186,000 pounds. That today is equivalent to 27 million pounds. So when people tell me an exhibition has been a success, I think that is what kind, what's your profit margin. And it was a profit, they called it the surplus at the time. And of course, that, that's the money that is used to buy the land that leads to this 
great um, culture forum that, that we, we are in now here today. This is a punch cartoon that wasn't too happy though. They didn't know at that point what was going to happen to all the money. Of course, all the cities of Britain that had lent all their objects were expecting a slice of the pie. This is uh, Paxton uh, with his design for the Crystal Palace, receiving his bonus from Prince Albert as, as chair of the commission. And uh, I was surprised to work out for this talk that his, his, um, his, his bonus uh, is equivalent to 700,000 pounds today. Um, and Henry Cole, uh, as I say, was the administrator, so Paxton does the building, Cole does the contents, if you like. Cole's uh, uh, slice is equivalent to 400,000 pounds today. So on top of a salary he was getting of about 110,000. So I'm surprised um, they got away with, with what, what they did uh, in creating uh, South Kensington. Albert's vision for South Kensington for reuniting the arts and sciences through institutions that reconciled both. Uh, he, he initially commissioned um, uh, the architect C.R. Cockerell to design this whole neighborhood as a great sort of Versailles to the arts and sciences. Uh, but of course, it was far too, e even more expensive than the money they had to spend. And so he, Albert also commissions uh, his German friend, Gottfried Semper, to design this sort of Albert Hall beneath St. Pancras Station, uh, another sort of crystal palace. And that too was, was far too expensive to build. Uh, so at this point in, in the narrative, uh, I usually take us to the V&A and say this you know, leads on to South Kensington and, and the gradual evolution of the campus of museums that we have here. But um, there is another, there was another Crystal Palace. Um, and if you, if you type into Google uh, Crystal Palace, um, uh, you'd be surprised, well, you might not be surprised, that you get within, within 0.7 of a second, you get 111 million results and the first block of them all seem to be about Crystal Palace Football Club. Um, <laughs> now, uh, the reason for that is that there was another Crystal Palace, you probably know, uh, the one in the park stayed up for about a year, there was a lot of effort to try to keep it there, but eventually it was dismantled and rebuilt much bigger at Sydenham in South London, um, Bromley, and it's here that the football team is born. Uh, and, um, but uh, in 1861, and they claim to be the oldest professional football team. Now, Albert dies in December 1861, so I'm not going to try to claim that this is yet another thing that we can praise Albert for inventing professional football. Um, who knows? Perhaps somebody will find the letter that proves it was his idea all along. But uh, Crystal Palace starts in the grounds of, of Crystal Palace, the great auditorium, great, and it becomes everything. So this is not a place for showing off machines. This is a place where art and architecture and natural history, a sort of winter garden of the greatest hits of the world's art and, and buildings. And there's Richard the Lionheart on the left uh, in, in black, because he's going to be a bronze um, at, the, at this point. This is 1854 that it opens and it survives until 1936. Tragically, uh, a gas leak uh, causes this fire. And it really in the history of the V&A, one cannot underestimate the, the sense of rivalry, the competition that this institution opened by Victoria and Albert in 1854 must, must have presented to all the early directors of the museum. On the right, uh, in case you're wondering whatever became of the Osla Fountain, the glass, the Schweppes fountain, I'm afraid it melted in the fire in 1936 beyond, beyond repair. You do have it still on your bottles. Next time you look at a bottle of Schweppes, it's there as their trademark. So uh, that could be the sad end of, of this lecture. But I thought, well, if it's 170th anniversary today of the closing, uh, what are we going to do for the 175th? You know, what could we do um, to celebrate in five years' time. And there was another option. So when they were all arguing about what to do uh, with the Crystal Palace, right through to June 1852, closes in October 51, it was still there, still being used for concerts and, and as a winter garden. Paxton had formed the Crystal Palace Company, uh, and, and that's what 
and he took it to Sydenham eventually. But uh, there were other ideas around uh, uh, in 1852, and um, on the 1st of May 1852, the anniversary of the opening in 1st of May 1851, um, an architect called uh, Charles Burton uh, published this idea in the building news. And I just wondered if you might want to think about this four or five years from now. This is basically taking the Crystal Palace, which was built to be re recycled, built in modular form, and he just stacked it up on its side, pretty much, um, and, uh, and published it and campaigned to um, create uh, a, high, a tower, a prospect tower. This is 30 years before the world's first skyscraper in Chicago, and that was only 10 stories tall. This is 50 stories tall, uh, and it had ascending rooms. It had elevators. They didn't call them elevators. They had ascending rooms. So he saw, he, his vision um, was to have us, like today, you know, but high in the sky. Uh, so he could have built Albertopolis on just one acre um, rather than uh, 186 that we are now. So I'd just like to leave you with that thought on a high note that perhaps uh, the Royal Commission for the ex Great Exhibition of 1851 might like to um, put its sights high for the next five years. And uh, after all, the, the lawn is still free. There's no trees to worry about. Uh, and uh, maybe we can all meet again high in the sky in, uh, in five years' time. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much. That was beautiful. I hope you all agree that was absolutely fascinating. I felt really like I was walking through it and I wish I could go back in time and see some of that stuff. Um, I'm sure we have questions in the room. Has anyone got a question they're burning to ask, first of all? Yep, right at the back up here. Uh, just wait for the mic to come over to you. It's uh, so that people can hear online as well because it'll go through there. That's all right. Yeah, so how, how did it make its money? I mean, was it through an entrance fee or um, trade inside the um, building, etc.? Yeah, how, how did it make all that money, £27 million pound profit? Well, it didn't own the building, for one thing. It, um, that was the Crystal Palace company uh, buys it, takes it away. It was quite expensive to get in. Um, to, um, there was a problem to get people to buy season tickets, I worked out that a season ticket of four guineas, no, three guineas for men, two guineas for women, uh, works out in today's money for a man 400 pounds. Uh, it's it's a, quite a, an outlay, and, uh, but to get them to, to buy them, they said you could only come to the Royal Opening if you had a season ticket, and that's how they got the 25,000 tickets sold very quickly, uh, because people didn't know what they were going to see. Um, and then people always say that there were shilling days for the poor. Well, I worked out also the shilling, and I can remember from my childhood in the 1960s, the shilling was a lot of money. You could buy a very nice bar of chocolate for a shilling. <laughs> you wouldn't, but uh, a shilling was about seven pounds. So if you're a large family, that's, again, a big outlay. So they, um, they, they, they priced it high, uh, and um, that, I think, you have to recognize the consequence of that, that they were appealing not to uh, everybody, but to um, the, the, if the laboring classes were there, they were the, the higher end of that. You know, there were skilled workers, engineers and so forth, uh, hands-on workers, um, not, not the urban poor. And there were charities that found ways of taking groups uh, to, to visit. And of course, you've also got the cost of traveling to London and staying to London. Um, but yes, it was, ex it really, I think it was expensive to get in. And there are lots of complaints about the catering as well, that the food, you know, the, the, the thinness of the ham sliced in the sandwiches and things. Yeah. It, it's funny how familiar, you know, in running museums. You know. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, over here? What do you mean? Thank you. Um, did it change very much? Because we've talked about the design. 
And it was obviously an exhibition to try and improve the design in industry and design in art. Also, presumably also to try and improve the technical developments of, you showed farm machinery, but there were also screw manufacturing machinery and stuff like that there. Um, but did it have a lasting effect? Obviously, the museums and the money mm. was there, but did it actually achieve its purpose, which was to lift the whole um, standard of uh, manufacturing in this country? Well, the, the, the basic thinking was that you don't just improve standards by creating art schools and training teachers. You need to educate the public as well to be more discerning as buyers. So it was a sort of virtuous circle where the, the consumer drove the demand. The consumer would say to the retailer, that's not good enough, I want something better. So there, there was um, a continuing uh, raising of expectations from manufacturers. The only way you can really judge the impact, I think, is by comparing uh, the, the next World's Fairs, the centenary, no, sorry, the, the, the decade later, what should have been the 1861 exhibition, but was 1862. Uh, the machinery there is um, much more uh, uh, very military. There's a, there's a lot more weaponry on display at, at that time. The, um, but the, it's, I talked about the founding of the v because that's where I, I work, but there was a parallel institution here, of course. The v collected science instruments as well. Uh, the Science Museum grows out of the South Kensington Museum, and so a lot of the um, exemplary objects in the Science Museum uh, also have their roots in, in the Crystal Palace. I can't speak for industry, but um, in terms of the, the long-term impact on, on British design. Uh, uh, I think uh, that's where we are now with the creative industries of which we're so proud, whether it's you know, um, fashion or, or pop music or cinema, uh, the legacy is definitely there uh, today on, on the art side. Um, somebody else would need to speak on the science side. I'm afraid. Thank you. Uh, there's a question over here. Uh, just as it goes around, uh, I will remind those who are watching online, you can post questions on YouTube and they should get through to me on this iPad here. Hi, thank you so much for that lecture. Um, you mentioned about the $27 million uh, profit and I know some of it you know, went to pay fees. Um, but then the, the two um, uh, uh, architect um, samples for, for the space, you said it was too expensive to actually develop. Can you elaborate a little bit more about you know, how did the VNA, the science, the Imperial, you know, how did the sort of South Kensington get developed? Well, it would be nice to think that there was a master plan for, so the question is about South Kensington and how it evolves. And it would be nice to think that um, Albert would have overseen the creation of what we call Albertopolis. But um, I'm afraid he dies in 1861 and it's, it's very competitive. And there are a lot of, uh, uh, there's a lot, there's, there's a lot of uh, wrangling, one must, can only say, over who gets which bit of remaining land. Uh, so it's a, it's a long story, perhaps, perhaps it's next year's lecture, if you like. Um, but uh, we, we even got to the point that Henry Tate wanted to create his gallery uh, where the Science Museum is now. And that was uh, quite, a, quite an outcry in protest uh, that science should stay on, on the west side and, and the art should stay on, on, on the east side of Exhibition Road, which is a terrible situation. That's why I'm so glad to be speaking in Imperial College to cross this ravine, uh, this street called Exhibition Road. So there, there is government money. Um, the, when the Natural History Museum comes, it is part of the British Museum and it still I mean, it has that in brackets uh, on its old signage. Um, Imperial College evolves out of, out of the science schools. Um, um, the Albert Hall is really Henry Cole's creation, which is why it has that same brickwork and, and terracotta as the entrance to the museum, the South Kensington Museum. So uh, it is quite, um, quite a hodgepodge of initiatives. Uh, some of which have disappeared. The Imperial Institute uh, was replaced by Imperial College in effect, but the Great Tower survives. Uh, and then there is also private enterprise here. So the Royal Commission for 1851 had to reinvent itself as a developer, basically. It, done, it had done its job with the exhibition. 
it then gets a, a sort of new charter and uh, it, it's responsible for developing the neighborhood uh, and it does also build a lot of real estate and houses to uh, bring in income for itself but it's it's a, it's a patchwork it didn't have um, a, a presiding prince consort to get the politicians to bang their heads together and so forth and and uh, one could speculate as to how different it is uh, what i feel is the great loss is the open space that albert really wanted here and to be fresh air from central london so they really what he wanted the national gallery to come here um, because Trafalgar Square was too smelly and, and noisy and dirty and, and some of the benefactors uh, of their art to the museum want, liked the fact there were huge gardens here. Um, the Royal Horticultural Society's gardens uh, have all gone, all disappeared. So uh, it, um, it, it gradually has infilled and, uh, and it's um, it, it, architecturally it's, it's a fascinating survey of British 19th century and early 20th Edwardian uh, building um, but uh, it, it, it doesn't have the so coherency that a, a royal vision could have given us. Thanks yeah question at the front here. Are you aware of, no, uh, oh, sorry, just one second. <laughs> um, are you aware uh, at Sydenham uh, there is now a full-size corner of the Crystal Palace that's been put up on, within the foundations of the Crystal Palace, the Paxton Crystal Palace corner was put up 10, ten years ago now to give, to give the impression of the size yes. of what a little bit of it might have been. And that what, and in, you were talking about the expo that started now, this latest World Fair, and Paxton's Crystal Palace was the first World Expo. Um, with, it, it, it's not a coincidence that uh, the restaurant in there, they have called it this year the 1851 restaurant and uh, i'm just wondering whether that was an input from the vna or the great uh, the the folk uh, in I, imperial I, college or the like and is there anything else that's going to be happening relating to the crystal palace the mother of all expos um in the uk uk pavilion say on february the 10th next year which is the uk day that you're aware so, so i didn't know that thank you for sharing that so february the 10th next year is uk day in Dubai, in Dubai at the World's Fair, so let's all meet up there, and that, that would be nice. Uh, when there was the World's Fair in Shanghai, I was lucky enough to go, and they had an exhibition on the history of, of the World's Fair, and they borrowed a big painting from the v and when I showed you the royal opening, and they then afterwards had it copied, um, we arranged it to be copied in oil paint by a, an artist, as part of a permanent exhibition in Shanghai. Uh, so we, we do have that um, presence, that, that profile with the World's Fair tradition and are always happy to help. But we, we were going to get involved, the v and I remember, but um, it was a, a previous director uh, who, uh, who, who died, I'm afraid. So we, we didn't, uh, in Dubai, we, we don't, I don't think we have a formal connection, uh, but uh, we're, we're always happy to to sort of bang that drum every time a World's Fair opens. It's yeah. Osaka next, next one. Is it Osaka? Okay, yeah. right. Well, yeah. Thank you. Right. Thanks so much. Uh, any other questions in the room? Checking around. Um, I have one. So obviously you mentioned that you're working on a book and you said there are a few books there. Sort of what makes your book different? What approach yeah. are you taking? Well, thank you for that uh, opportunity to <laughs> plug my book. What uh, there are say two and a half thousand titles in the National Art Library about the Computer on Exhibition, but um, the, the books that I showed you, uh, they're all full of words essentially. And what we've done is look at pictures. So what I, uh, I have a few points to get off my chest, such as you know the orientation, things that you see that you haven't been written. And so what I'm hoping putting together is what I call a, a visual anthology. Uh, that will help people to understand uh, quite what it was like to visit and what people really wanted to see at the time. So today really has been a preview and I, I hope you'll all want to buy a copy. <laughs> Excellent. We'll look out for that when it comes around. 
Well, I think that's uh, all we have time for. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming to this great Exhibition Road Festival event. There are more events throughout today, tomorrow on campus, and then throughout the week as well, some online and some here. So we'll hope you come along. Um, you can also follow us on our social channels if you're so inclined. Um, sorry if we weren't able to get to any questions that you might have had today. This event has been recorded as well as streamed on YouTube, so it will appear on the Great Exhibition Road YouTube channel shortly as well. Before I let you go, I do have a little hint that we would love to know what you thought about this event and the festival itself. So there's little QR codes on some of the desks um, behind me for those of you in the room. And on YouTube, there'll be a link to an evaluation form shortly posted as well. Um, these are important for us. It only takes about five minutes and it helps us plan what we're going to do in the future with these events. And also, you could win a 50 quid shopping voucher. So it's win-win, really. Um, otherwise, it just remains for me to thank Julia so much for this beautiful tour. I really found it very inspiring and I hope you did too. And I hope you have an excellent afternoon. That's all from me. Thank you. Thank you.